My name is Andy Salterek. Uh, little quick bio. Uh, obviously, the accent. I'm not from here. Um, an Aussie who's been living here in the UK now for three or four four years. Um, my background is very specifically in the world of cyber. Uh, I've lived on both sides of the cybersecurity world, which is the preventative side, which is working in organisations to actually improve cyber defence, uh, of which most recently uh, I was at KPMG doing a two-year cyber uplift program. Uh, and I've also been on the other side, uh, which is uh, seven times in my career I have been in a major critical response team. Uh, of which one I can tell you about, which is, if anyone is, is old enough, if you remember the EMC RSA exploit that occurred, uh, I was actually on the CritSit team that, that worked on that. Uh, and I can tell you right now, it is way more fun working on the preventative side as opposed to the response side. So the talk I want to give today is going to focus a little bit more on what it is we can do as a, as a, as a, a group of, of t as teams on the preventative side of the environment. Now, this, the talk is, tight, uh, is titled AI and what, we, what impact AI is having on us. And when they asked me to do that, uh, I've got to say I was surprised because I am one of the people who is the most AI skeptical Pragmatic, pragmatic realist, maybe, is the thing. I am a little sick and tired of every presentation being started with AI as the buzzword that's going to capture us into the, into the environment. Having said that, it is in the title and I will talk about it, but I'm going to talk about what it is and where it is being used and probably where it should not be used and where we are going to use different techniques and different approaches to doing that, uh, to the uh, improving our cyber resiliences as organisations. So, uh, also, who's sick of the scary world slide that everyone puts up? <laughs> I'm literally not going to spend any time on this at all. It is a scary world. Stuff is happening. The, uh, the attackers are changing their approach and their methodologies in terms of uh, uh, their mechanisms that is absolutely true. It is a constant uh, battle. Uh, there, is, uh, an e there is a set of escalations occurring based on new techniques. That is true. But as an industry, we're also getting better. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I'm not going to spend any time on that. I'm sure lots of other people will talk about that this as, as an issue. So what is some of the impacts of AI on security? Um, let me just talk two seconds about a, a little analogy that I was trying to think of for AI. Um, and I actually looked at my travel bag today uh, and, I talk, and I was thinking about a, a particular technology and that technology I was thinking about was wireless technology. Right? Now, has wireless technology improved our lives? Has it given us things and enabled things to occur? that historically we could not do? Absolutely yes. I work for Telstra. Uh, my mobile phone is constantly connected to me at all times. Uh, however, I would like to show you the bag that I carry around with me, which is the cables, various cables, interconnectors, hubs, muxes, etc., etc., that I carry with me. Now, the point I'm trying to make is wireless is a great technology, but it does not solve all problems. My concern about the conversations we're having around AI right now is we are seeing it as an absolute panacea that will solve all our problems forever and ever. Amen. That is absolutely incorrect. Right. Um, there are fundamental things that we as a, a community need to do around cyber that uh, while they need to be cognizant of AI, are still the core things from a hygiene perspective that we need to continue to do. And I'll talk about those specifically going forward. So, let's talk a little bit about AI and what it actually is 
being used for. And I will, I will go through one specific example. Uh, this particular example is a real life one that occurred to one of our, our customers two and a half weeks ago. So live, right? Uh, let's AI, what is AI specifically good at? Um, what it is good at is uh, creating a set of actions based on a significant amount of curated data. So if you get great curated data, it is very powerful at creating a set of actions based on that curated data. Um, large language model, hints in the name, large. <laughs> It is a significant amount of data that they've used to train a set of models to perform a set of actions. That's what it's great at. Uh, when I was at KPMG in Australia, we were doing banking remediation where we took all of the banking, or the, the historic data on customers who had been missold financial advice. We collected all that data, we extracted all the features of that, and we used AI to calculate what they should have been paid, as opposed to what they were paid. Good use. By the way, fun project. <laughs> um, but that, was, that is a great use of AI. So when you think about the use cases of AI from, an, uh, from, a, from a hacker perspective, that is exactly the same use cases as they're looking for. Right? Where can I collect a significant amount of data to create a set of actions that allow me to either penetrate or exfiltrate data from an organisation. Exactly the same, right? They're doing the same things as we are. They've got a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of tooling uh, to do that particularly well. I'd actually say probably the most, uh, the most common, a little boring, but most common, is actually AI-driven phishing, right? The, the, the construction, what AI is very good based on large language models in construction of communications and that look to all intents and purposes like they come from somebody. I got one the other day, it was fantastic. I, I, I never click on a link, so it was okay. But it was really good. It came, I mean, it came from my Australian mobile supplier. Well, actually it didn't. But it, that's what it looked like, to all intents and purposes. Logos were correct. URL looked really close. It wasn't right, but it looked really close. That, that is a really powerful use case, and that is going on a lot in our environment. Um, the other one is the use of AI to create multiple vectors of feedback. And I'll actually show you this one, because it's a, it's a really good example. Um, this particular attack, because we actually did the forensics on it and watched this, you could see this happen, uh, where there was a, a, an inbound, uh, it pinged up against the EDR, got blocked, went, I'm going to try something different, got blocked, uh, try again, came back again with an update of code, and then eventually got it back in. That loop happened 94 times, roughly. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, test, 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 bang, in, right? So, really interesting use of AI. Because one of the really other powerful use cases of AI um, is as a syntax and code generator. So all of the code that was being generated to perform these particular attacks wasn't a human sitting at the other end. It was actually an AI doing code generation that actually then went back in and bounced the other way. Um, so I've, I've started coding again, not because I want to, because it's kind of fun, and now I can just use any of the chat GPTs or whatever to do code generation. So very, it's really powerful at doing that sort of stuff. So. Um, if you look at down these 10 use cases, by the way, um, you, you, know, this, you can look at this list and you can double click on all of these particular attack vectors, but all of them have something in common, which is the use of uh, particular sets of data to perform another action 
based on some set of automated steps. That, that, that's what AI is really powerful at, right? Um, the, the, there was a really interesting, another attack that occurred just recently where it was this one down, and where was it? Uh, Oh, yeah, well, they were actually using model inversion. It was a model inversion attack. So they've actually looked at the actual logic of the AI model itself and then hacked that, changed its behavior, and allowed it to do something different. So some really interesting approaches and techniques that are, that are going on out there. But I'm here to say just one thing, which is, which is yes, from our side, from a preventative side, there is some value in AI. There are some use cases that are good. Right? Um, feature recognition in malware. I, I was lucky enough to work at a company called Silence that's now owned by BlackBerry. They were the, one of the first ones to use AI to do feature recognition of malware. The old way we used to do it, we used to use heuristics, check some, you know, look at a piece of malware and say, file name, uh, it's a piece of malware. The easiest thing in the world to defeat. You literally just repackage a piece of malware, send it out again, you're passed. We are way better now, right? The tooling that you've got, the EDR capabilities have significantly improved. Don't care who you buy it from, <laughs> it's better than it was a few years ago, right? Um, so that's useful. Uh, traffic analysis, absolutely. Right? It is a really powerful way to do anomaly detection, clustering, look for specific traffic patterns. It's good at that. Right? My point, though, is that's a bit late. <laughs> if I'm looking at a pattern that's occurring in my network and it's telling me that a piece of malware is, it's a bit late. So, what do I think we need to be doing? My view is that you, we need to refocus as an industry back on preventative controls. We've done a, the, the, the improvement in tooling on SEAM and SOAR, and it, it's great stuff, but it's all respond. I want to focus today a little bit more on prevent. So, the the, the common jargon, the common mechanism or the language that we're using nowadays to talk about more preventative controls is zero trust. And we'll talk a little bit about zero trust architectures. I in essence, what zero trust is trying to do is to put layers in our environment that allow us to create boundaries that are immutable. Now, that's a really hard thing to do because what is a computer network designed to do? It is designed to enable. It is designed to communicate. And what we're saying is, well, yeah, that's great, but to be, improve our uh, uh, cyber resilience, we've got to put some boundaries in that are manageable and controllable and all that sort of stuff. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So 10 seconds on security versus compliance. I, w I worked in large audit. I've worked for large auditors. I understand the world of compliance. Compliance is not security. Compliance is a set of controls that you put in place to allow you to, yes, understand, yes, measure your cyber security appetite and resilience. Still not security, though. My favourite one I pulled out the other day. There are roughly 1,200 controls in NIST, of which only 36 are in the protect area. That's crazy. Actually, I was going to go through and do it for ISO, NIST, DORA, you know, all of the new... I think they're all the same. So I think we've got caught up a little bit in measuring around the problem and not facing into the problem. So, of all the thousands of controls, when I've 
I've been lucky enough to run large programs. Which controls did we focus on as a team? The preventative ones. Right? So which are the preventative ones? Well, they're the ones that stop this from happening. Uh, they're the ones that literally say, we've had an initial breakdown in our preventative controls. To be clear, EDR, I'm going to talk about it in a second, malware, blocking, you have to have it. It's way better than it used to be. P make sure it's deployed, deployed effectively, measured effectively. You do that stuff. That's 101, right? So, but that fails. I gave you an example of it failing just before. It fails for lots of reasons, right? Breach is spread. The lateral movement component, we'll talk a lot about lateral movement as a thing, and then for whatever reason, we don't effectively manage the particular contagion that's occurred. So lateral movement by definition is probably one of the biggest issues we have in our networks. Um, I don't think there's a single customer that we're working with at the moment that hasn't started off with what they would describe as a flat network for various reasons, right? Firewalls are fantastic, they're really useful, but when you get to a firewall estate that has 15 million rules in it, we've got a problem. Because about 200 of those rules are effective, they're north-south rules, the rest of them are doing east-west traffic management, which they were never designed to do. So by definition, you'll find a, a rule somewhere hidden in there that says any, any. Right? So, I'm sorry, that is not an effective control. We are running flat networks, we are running flat identity servers, we are, we're in a flat world. So we've got to get better at doing that. Because without doing, removing this, that flatness, we will get lateral contagion. When they're in, they're in. So, what's the approach? Zero trust. Um, by the way, Illumio does this thing here in the middle. We do segmentation. It's all we do. We're a pure play. I won't talk specifically about the product, but that's exactly what we do. But as an architectural approach, as a philosophy, because zero trust is actually a philosophy, right? It's not a thing you can buy. Right? It's an approach that you take. And when you look at certain areas, there are certain things that support the implementation of zero trust, but it isn't a thing. So anyone who's selling you zero trust, run. It is a set of capabilities and an approach that basically relies on least privilege. Right? So when we take a customer from starting state to the point at which you literally f turn on a button that says, deny all traffic except for these things, then you're in zero trust. Right? So. so which controls actually work? Which preventative controls are useful? Um, and it, initially I put the word up there, um, I actually put EDR up there, and I went, no, 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 that's not what I mean at all. Because I looked through the, if you, your EDR vendor will have about 200 features in there, of which one is the actual active blocking of a piece of malware executing. That's what I mean. If you, do not have, if you haven't got that implemented, that's a significant risk as an organisation. Uh, protect your keys. Um, I'll just sorry, jump to this one. Protect your key infrastructure. Not sexy, but I know of at least 12 successful exploits where the cryptographic boundary of the organisation was broken because they managed to get at the keys. Keys, especially root keys, should never be in software, ever, ever, ever. HSMs, hardware, that is a boundary that protects your cryptographic health. If you are running a cryptographic environment, 
you need to be running an HSM of some description. Either you, the cloud suppliers give them to you nowadays as part of the offering, just use them. The EMC hack, by the way, it was beautiful, right? It used virtually every technique known to man, of which one of them was the access to the core root keys in software. So dumped server, keys exposed, <laughs> off you go. That was a company that sold HSMs, by the way. <laughs> so, so um, by the way, the reason I'm allowed to talk about this one is because there was actually a con US congressional hearing on it. So this is all public domain. So just so you know, if you're ever interested in doing an anatomy of a really good attack, have a read of that one. It's really good. So keys. Um, next one, privileged account management. Again, no excuse. Domain servers, um, just, again, I don't care what tool, I don't care if you do it yourselves, you build your own tooling, it doesn't matter. But the protection of privileged accounts, again, is, has been at least part of every successful exfiltration of data of scale, pretty much of all of the ones I've seen in the last four or five years. Okay, so do that. And the least sexy of them all, train your people. And I mean, user training we're all doing. The, the user community that I'm the most passionate about are the developers. The people that are now doing dev sec ops that are doing continuous release of capability into production on an hourly, weekly, monthly basis, that group screws up, you are exposed. The Microsoft released this the other day, their hack was dev server left out pointing to the internet. Now, tooling helps, but training helps as well. So, what's the other one? What we do? Network segmentation. Network segmentation is specifically designed to stop lateral movement in the network. Okay? It literally puts a boundary around something, just as cryptographic capabilities do, just as identity things do. They're all segmentation approaches of some type or another. But we do network segmentation. Why doesn't the current approach actually work? I talked a little bit about the firewall thing before. Uh, and I'm a network guy. I'm a network engineer. That's how I started my life, right? Um, why don't they work? Well, because they lack visibility. You, you, you literally can't see all the traffic that's flowing in your network. It's almost impossible to visualize right now. You have lots of different administrative points with administrative controls. And if anyone talks to you about control frameworks and control mechanisms, one of the powerful ones is you need a control that is measured and monitored, not 15 of them managed by different teams. Overlapping controls, bad. The policy is actually tried to the physical network asset. What the hell does an IP address know about? Oh, sorry, I'll just go. What does an IP, oh, by the way, a very cleverly introduced, really bad piece of grammar there, sorry, that was my bad. Policy should be decoupled from the network. A network literally does not know anything about the application context, the user context, the, the development versus prod, the, it doesn't know any of that stuff. So how can you write an effective boundary condition if you don't have the business context to write it? I can tell you how you do it. You write 15 million rules in a firewall. You do top of rack switching. You do, I mean, you do all sorts of crazy stuff that the network was literally never designed to do. So the whole idea is you need to decouple security, the security control from the network layer. It's, it, we, by the way, we've done this in all parts of our IT infrastructure. Virtualization, that was a decoupling of the operating system layer from the physical hardware. 
And we do that because it allows you to scale and manage policy and do controls in a, in a powerful way. The other ones, um, I think, are just architectural points when you are doing network segmentation that need to be true. But by the way, I think Forrester just released a report that said over 50 per cent, actually it wasn't over, it was under, it was 48 per cent, I think, 48 per cent of network segmentation projects either stall or fail. Reason number one, the top one at the top, I just said there, right, which was the decoupling problem. Reason number two is we buy tools that literally don't match the organisational model that we run. By the way, Microsoft drive me insane with the tenant model and one product you can do this, you know, you can do regional stuff and the other product you can't. So when you buy tooling in this area, make sure that it is capable of running in the way that you need to run as an organisation. Whether it's centralised, fully federated, halfway in between, doesn't matter. You've got to have an RBAC model that actually supports that. I'm a huge fan of pure play products. I do not believe in what we call thick platforms, which are things that just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow in functionality, which means that eventually they can't move fast enough to match the attack vector and they die. We've seen this a bunch of times. So make sure that you look at the tooling, but then it needs to integrate to other stuff. So make sure that that's easy. And then the agent technology. Um, this is an architectural statement as well. Uh, we all were around, I don't know how, how many of you run CrowdStrike, we do. <laughs> we saw a major issue, we saw an issue, one for a whole bad bunch of process issues, but one of them was an architectural issue. That agent is in line with the kernel. Now it needs to be, because of what an EDR does. There are lots of tools out there that are hooking the kernel right now that literally don't need to. So be very careful about the architecture. I know it's not sexy, it's a really techy thing, but the operational impact of a, of a piece of software that hooks the kernel that fails is monstrous. So the architecture of the agent, if you're deploying one, needs to be robust. So what do we think? As an organisation, AI has its uses. We're going to use it. Right? We, we use it for clustering. So we, we, when we do a visibility of a particular environment, we can look at it and go, that looks like an application. So let's tag it as that without having to grab all the metadata and all that kind of stuff. We can literally do some profiling clustering based on AI and then do labelling based on that. Good use case. But the most important thing is, let's understand the key risk. Lateral movement, contagion risk, if it's not in the top three technology risks that your tech risk teams are looking at, I would be surprised. Right? So understand the risk, define the controls effectively, and my case is, look at preventative controls first. I'm not saying don't do the others, I'm just saying as a primary focus, look at preventative controls. And then most importantly, make sure that the, one of the controls that you have in place is some form of segmentation. Obviously, we prefer you to use ours, but at least have that as part of the zero trust architecture that you're deploying. Thank you very much.